Hello and welcome to the channel. It's March, it's still cold, clear skies, no cloud cover, temperatures dropping at night, and it is pretty pretty chilly to be honest, so the fire's on. There will be the odd pop and bang from the fire. And what am I up to? What am I up to? We're in full isolation now. I say full isolation, we're in isolation. The whole UK is in isolation for about three weeks, possibly more. And no fishing. Absolutely devastated. I thought we was going to get away with it. I thought they was going to allow certain things to still continue. And being on your own on an uncrowded beach at night in the middle of nowhere feels pretty isolated to me. But that isn't a dig or a poke. Some very clever people have looked at the numbers, done the sums, and I'm happy to comply. Happy to comply, but I still need my fishing fix. So what am I going to do? exactly what everyone else is doing I think I'm gonna go right through my kit I'm gonna go through my kit absolutely every last piece I'm gonna make a list of things that I need to buy in the future the things that I'm missing the things that need to be replaced I'm gonna clean everything I'm gonna tidy everything I'm gonna make sure my filleting knife is the sharpest filleting knife on the planet and all the other things and I thought I might as well film it film it and share it with you guys I'm also going to do some more rig tutorials. So there's two films in production. Is that the right word? Production. Editing as we speak. Fishing last night. Caught some fish. Fish on camera. Always good. Um, yes, yeah, so I caught some fish last night. Had a nice ray about a week ago. And yeah, so I'm going to prep and clean my kit. Prep and clean my kit. But there is one thing. So I did notice that it's been an issue with personal hygiene equipment. Personal hygiene equipment, people bulk buying loo rolls. An epiphany. What can I do to alleviate that? Hey, <laughs> I've got it sussed. I've got the biggest toilet rolls. It's bigger than my head. <laughs> I've got bags of them. <laughs> Not because I've gone out and panic bought and bought loads of toilet rolls. It's because I have them in the workshop. I have them in the workshop hung up when I'm drying things, working on engines, doing whatever I'm doing. <laughs> Look at the size of that! She's a monster! And the best thing is, I haven't told anyone, but it's the right size for Mrs W. <coughs> I'm going to get shot in her. <laughs> It's Mrs. W's own personal size loo roll. Look at that. She's a beast. <laughs> anyway, enough of that nonsense. I couldn't resist it. So what am I going to do first? Well, I'm going to do a bit of cleaning first. And the thing I always do first is the thing that's most fragile. I don't want to transfer sand and grit and dirt and gunk from you know, like something to something else if I'm going to scratch or ruin it in the process. So first up, Fishing rods. Gonna wash and then treat my fishing rods. Gonna inspect all the eyes and do all that kind of stuff as well. So that's what I'm gonna do first. So part of this process for me is as much about checking to make sure there's no accumulated damage. These have been used pretty hard for the last, last few fishing trips. They've had no respite in between. They haven't been cleaned, they haven't been checked. And they just need a little bit of love. So just getting them out of the bag there, all the all the gubbins, all of the um, eyes look like they're, they're all good. And then for me really, first thing is the business end, just to have a quick look. So I don't know if you know, but I've mentioned it in previous videos now. I fitted a casting cannon to each of the rods because I'm running braid straight through, straight off the big reels. And just having a quick look, just to make sure all the ferro ends. There's no no blistering, no no cracks. Dirty, they are dirty. Dirty rods. Um, and this this is the eye. This and the end on the tip seem to get the most sort of wear and action. But no, that all looks good. I'd even go so far to say is 
they possibly don't need a they don't need a wash. They're not all greasy and covered in dry bait residue or anything like that. The end tip's good. And do you know what? Now that I've got it, I've got my bucket of water ready to go. I'm not going to wash these rods. I'm going to put as little water on them as possible. I know they get wet and in the weather and at sea and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to go straight on to how I like to treat them. And I like to treat them like a lady. <laughs> I like to lube them up and rub them down. The, um... <laughs> Let's get rid of this bucket. I don't need that bucket now, do I? So, my motorbike cleaning stuff that I use for cleaning my motorbike. Nice soft cloth. Four or five squirts on there. And I just give them a little bit of love, you know. Especially around all the metal parts, around the eyes. Just make sure there isn't anything that may be stuck inside there, dried on seaweed. Um, bait residue, I don't know, any of those nasties and just make sure that you don't put any on the um, interference parts that slot the rods together because that could be disastrous. A nice decent cast you might lose a section or both sections of your rod and nobody likes to lose their rod. So yeah, it's all good. So I hope everyone's well. I hope everyone's looking after themselves. I hope everyone it's considered all of the bits and pieces. Nobody's bulk buying, nobody's going out and panicking, but everyone's looking after each other, keeping your distance and all that kind of stuff. This isn't a public service announcement, it's just me jibber jabbering away whilst I'm doing my rods. I'm now officially working from home. Work sent me home. I'm very fortunate, I'm lucky like that, I realise that. Yeah, so. That's come up an absolute tree. It comes up like a gloss finish and then when it dries, it dries back to like a satin finish. And it's not greasy, it's not greasy, it's got no residue, it's not sticky. It's absolutely tip top. And I've definitely shown my reel some love with this stuff. So I was talking to my mate Colin the other night, we went fishing um, before the, the restrictions were in place. We did keep our distances, no kissing. Um, definitely no tongues, the, uh, he had a problem with his reel seat where it all bound up. And we were talking about it and I'd had something very similar previously where my, one of mine had bound up to the point where he didn't want to turn it because it felt like you were forcing it and something was going to break. You know, they are plastic at the end of the day. And um, I found previously that if you just ran hot, not quite boiling, but hot water over it, it expands, move it slightly, give it a nice clean with a soft cloth and keep repeating it and then it will move up and down the rod without any friction or any any dramas and then it's one of the things that I pay attention to now so I do it to its full extent and just with a bit of that like lubricant wipe preservation stuff just a little bit on the on the thread because it likes it. Why do you put it on there? Because it likes it. And then I always run it all the way to the bottom again. And I don't know if you can hear, that sounds quite loose and rattly, because that's how it's meant to be. And that's one of the rods done. I'm not going to presume that this rod is any better or any worse. I'm going to Check it on its own merits. I'm going to have to put some more wood on the fire before I lose all the heat. I can feel the heat, the temperature drop in the workshop as soon as the fire starts to burn down. These rods have had some hard use over the last couple of weeks and they're still faring up quite well. They still look good. They're not prematurely aging, the finishes are still good. I don't know if you've noticed, I've not put any more stuff on that cloth. There's enough residual on that cloth to do this rod as well. 
and the real seat and these are Fuji and it says it's a quality product <laughs> there's being presumptuous isn't it it's a quality product well I think we'll be the judge of that eh? to be honest I quite like them it's all been good so far I have enjoyed using these rods they are nice at the bargain end of rods they're not particularly expensive but they stand up well and just run that all the way down one thing I'm always careful to do never mix and match even if you've got a pair of rods don't start mixing and matching mid or the top sections yeah you know, use swap this mid section for that mid section and get them confused and all the rest of it because they do fit together and when I say fit the wear they wear together so the more they're used taken apart put back together they do get used to each other I suppose is a is a good way of describing it you don't want to be messing that fit up by swapping them backwards and forwards between each other Just on this rod here, I'm just starting to see the slightest change in lacquer colour. It's not peeling, it's not blistering, but there's a slight change in the lacquer on that one. And then pay a decent amount of attention to the tip. Always got to look after your tip. <laughs> Mrs. W's toilet roll, where'd that go? I'll make sure I don't lose that. She's gonna murder me if she ever sees this. <laughs> I'll get bobbitted. Right. And that's that. I'll leave them out to air dry. I'm just gonna put this to one side for now. Because I'm gonna move on to something else. But first is first, we need some wood. My last pallet my last pallet of the winter. I won't be getting any more now. The next part really needs a little bit of TLC and a little bit of care and attention. Are your reels? Now these are greasy, dirty, but there are parts of them that you don't really want to get wet if you can help it. So you can rinse your reel out if you want to, if you want to get your salt off your braid and all that kind of stuff. I think that's a little bit excessive but I do want to get all the greasy residue off. Get all the greasy residue from baiting up and to be honest it's part of my own fault because I bait up, I give my hands a cursory wipe in a cloth or rinse out in a bucket of water and I go and cast out inevitably I transfer all the greasy rubbish from the hands all over the reels and I'm not particularly good at keeping them clean when I'm out there I just rely on cleaning them when I get back one thing I will mention is sand is an absolute killer for reels if you get sand in any of the working parts any of the mechanism it prematurely wears the reel and it's absolutely A known killer for reels they don't survive sand very well and because a couple of places we fished recently have been sandy there is a little bit in there not much but a bit worth taking some time and care over fires being noisy also like with the rods don't mix and match if you're running a pair of reels Keep your reel components with your reel components. So the main body, the spool, and the clutch on top. Keep them. Keep it. It's just good working practice, just to keep them all, all together. So everything for your left reel is your left reel. Everything for your right reel is your right reel. And never the two shall meet. Don't mix and match. This one has got a little bit more sand than the other one. How more sand got in one reel than the other, I don't know. I don't remember. 
<laughs> your worst nightmare, isn't it? Dropping your kit on a sandy beach. Something like your reel or your rod with your reel. If it comes off the stand or you're standing up against something and you're just like, your heart absolutely sinks, doesn't it? Absolutely sinks because you're like, oh, <laughs> what a nightmare. And the only damage on these reels, apart from the transfers that started coming off almost from day one, I'm not fussed about water transfers, water slip or transfer transfers, whatever you call them, I don't know. Um, the only damage on these reels was when I actually, and again your heart sinks, I dropped one, I clattered it. And even then it stood up pretty well to it. There's a couple of tiny, alright, ease up. There's a couple of marks on one of the reels. You have to know they're there to look for them, sort of thing. You know, only very small. But you can't help but feel a little bit gutted when, you, when you've when you done it yourself. <laughs> when it's your fault. So that's two nice clean spools. The clutch arrangement. I'm not going to touch the inside of it because it's lightly greased. It doesn't need any more grease. But the outer part of it is dirty. Needs a little bit. And just check on that clutch pressure pad that there's no sand, no sand or grit has got on there because that would be catastrophic for the wear of your reel as well. And I always put them with that piece pointing upwards. Just show you what I'm talking about there. Look, so that pressure pad, that piece there, just make sure there's no sand on it. And it's got that light grease, light amount of grease to it. I'm just cleaning the outside because the outside, as everything else, needs a little bit of love, needs to be looked after. The fire is nice and warm. So the actual real bodies, I tend not to wash. And the reason why I don't wash them is one, I don't want. any water getting into the body itself really there's no need for it um, I'm just checking to see what the grease is like that it's got a decent amount of grease and if you rotate it very slowly even under its own sort of weight that's usually when you get to hear squeaks that's when the squeaks first become evident if they do need some greasing greasing or a little bit of love will do is preserve it a little bit and give it a bit of a wipe over now I've had these reels since the autumn of last year and I've been holding back on doing any kind of review on them yet until you know they've had one full season and they've had a real decent amount of use and they have had a fair bit of use they do get used a lot um, but I'm just starting to notice as if there's a little bit of clearance in the backlash. And when I say the clearance in the backlash, if I was to push and pull between the rotating assembly and the real body, there is a little bit of clearance. And I'm just wondering, personally, what that gets to before you're supposed to make an adjustment or buy new I'm guessing there's like a thrust washer in there or something a little shim or something so I'm going to have to look into that mainly for my own satisfaction it's not contradictory to the reel at the moment the reels are behaving but it's just something I'm a bit fussy a bit picky I suppose but if there's something in there that needs to be checked adjusted then I should be checking and adjusting it. Just gone over the whole body of the reel with this stuff. And then I will let it air dry. But when I put it on the bench, and I'll show you in a second, everything's in an order. So all the left hand stuff's left hand, all the right hand stuff's right hand. The rods are left and right. 
It all sounds a bit anal, I know. But it keeps me happy. Keeps me happy, keeps me busy. So that has had a nice going over. And the next reel, it's gonna sit. They've been used the same amount. So both reels have been used at the same times for the same amount of time. Same amount of casts. <laughs> I've never used one without the other. I might have packed one away early sometimes and the other one's you know, still been out or something like that. But it must have evened out over a period of time. So they are e wearing exactly the same. Both rods look exactly the same. But this, <laughs> and it, it, it makes my heart sink. This is the one that I clad. I've just spotted a couple of the marks where I dropped it. It's just on the rotating assembly there. Look. <laughs> everyone's done it. And everyone's devastated when they do. <laughs> so there, reel number two. Lovely, lovely, lovely action. Good reels, good reels for the money. So we looked at two rods, two reels. And now the tripod. So the tripod doesn't really need much in the way of maintenance, I know that. But, you can have a little bit of love. It's aluminium so it's not going to rust. But if I'm going through everything, I might as well give everything the once over for my own peace of mind. And all I'm looking at here is the pivot points. If anything was going to break it be around the pivot point. There's no moving parts on this, it's a very robust tripod this one actually. Very simplistic and it is a leader icon. Um, I know I seem to be like a bit of a cheapskate but the, um, these are very reasonably priced as well. Especially when they're on offer, like when I purchased this one. I don't want to quote exact prices but it was it was less than 30 quid. Less than 30 quid, and it is simplicity in itself. Simplicity in itself, with one small flaw. So if you're thinking about getting one, I will show you. I'm gonna get it out now. So that's had a good old wipe down. And then to the one flaw, with the leader icon tripod. And it's this piece. So the lower cups come with this insert and this insert has a habit of losing itself. And if you lose that insert on a shingle beach, you ain't getting it again. So I've got in the habit of taking the lower cup off and putting it in my seat tackle box just so that I know that when I go to this, I know where this is going to be. I've actually got to the beach before now and had that with that missing and your heart sinks because you're like oh god really so I've just lost like a component backtracked and found it just sat on the shingle it's like that oh. found that on Chesil Beach in the middle of nowhere on the shingle couldn't believe my luck should have bought a lottery ticket that day So yeah, leader icon, nice wide cups, nice tall tripod. It's got the hook underneath that you can use for hanging scales. Or if you carry carrier bags, a couple of spare carrier bags with you when you go fishing, you can use one for taking your rubbish home. You can use another carrier bag to fill with stones to hang off the bottom of your tripod. Stop the wind from blowing it over. That works well. And then when you come to pack up, you can empty the stones out of the bag and you can double make sure all the rubbish has gone home with you. <laughs> no rubbish left behind. So 
So simplicity in itself really, the tripod. It is a good tripod, I do like it. I would recommend it. There's nothing to review on it really. It is exactly what it is. And that is the leader icon. I don't know, what's that? I'm four foot plus one foot and seven inches. And this must be, I don't know, is that six foot? I don't know because I'm not six foot tall, so I don't know what six foot looks like. <laughs> so that's all nice and clean and tidy. We like clean and tidy. So with the rods cleaned, put back into their sleeves, one of the things that I do like to do, um, and I think this one's quite important, I have got Jasper the fishing hound and have got uh, children and we do occasionally get mice although I haven't had any evidence of any mice in the workshop for a couple of years now but a couple of years back we did um, I put this will store four, four rods um, semi hard case nice good strong zips and it's good for transporting but also it's good for storing inside the workshop so they're all clean, dried, sleeved and now put away so I'm happy that when these go away they're safe and they're not going to get mucked about with and not going to get damaged they're not going to get damaged by accident whilst I'm doing something else in the workshop which <laughs> I can be a bit clumsy sometimes um, so yeah that's the rods done just going to put the reels together and put them in their cases and I'll show you what I've got for them so the real bodies are now clean, air dried, there's no greasy residue on them um, and they're ready to be stored so one of the things I find when I tend to clean these the line guides sometimes come out and they just get dressed back into their slots and then there's a little press fitting that sort of holds them in place now I used to think that they were like a splash guard but I was reliably informed that they're actually line guides and as you can see the way everything's laid out this is the right reel with the right spool and then the drag pressure plate that goes on top that's your adjustment as well for your drag and then what I like to do Let's just move that out of the way. So I release the clutch. And I know there's going to be people that don't like this. I put the line back on itself. And this is only because I'm storing these long term now for a while. And then using the clutch, put the spool into its lowest position until everything lines up make sure the clutch is fully released because someone else has, has uh, advised me that that is a good thing to do to release the clutch unspool the handle or unwind the handle and put it all together like that so it's as compact as it can be the clutch or the drag is fully released the spool is even a little bit loose if anything unwind the handle and it's in that orientation. Any real bag that suits your reel. These happen to be IMAX. I'm not sponsored by IMAX. These were paid for with my own money. <laughs> and then in the bag they go. In the bag they go. And if I had any concerns about moisture or dampness, you could put a little silica um, bag inside with it. But I'm not. And I won't because that is stored in a nice dry place inside another box. So then that is how I store my reel. So again, with the other one, this is the other body. Um, I've got to put the line guides on. So the line guides, just little rubber, they look like little windscreen wipers just make sure they're seated two of them have come off with this one whilst I've been cleaning 
They're quite easy to knock off, to be honest. Quite easy to knock off when you're actually handling the reel. I'm surprised I haven't lost them till till now. So that is the line guides back on. Just offer up the spool. Now I know there's a lot of subscribers that watch this channel that this is you know academic. They they don't want to watch this. But please, fellas, as many people as don't want to watch it, there are a lot of people that do want to watch and do want to look at this kind of stuff, even if it seems trivial to the to the majority of us. And the main reason why I'm filming it is because I can. So to its lowest position, offer it so it's up and down. That means that when you undo the handle, it sits in its tidiest position. Make sure the drag is fully released. And that'll be this one in its bag. So for this evening, that's me. So I've cleaned two rods, two reels, my tripod, and that leaves all the little bits and pieces for tomorrow. I don't want to peak too early. I've got three weeks to do all this. <laughs> three weeks. Three weeks of, yeah. I know. So yeah, so happy days. I've got three weeks to go through everything. So I think the next time, tomorrow, I will go through my rigs. Go through my rigs, concentrate on rigs, see where we're at. And then I've got a couple of little surprises. So for anyone that doesn't know how to properly or effectively sharpen a fillet knife, filleting knife, I've got a surefire way that gets you an absolute razor's edge on a fillet and knife. That's a good one to watch. Um, and a few other bits and pieces. Don't want to give too much away. But yeah, so rods, reels, tripod, done tonight. Tomorrow I'm going to look at rigs, possibly the fillet and knife. If not, that'll be the night after. And slow time, I'm going to go through all my gear. Make sure it's all tip top. <sighs> Hello and welcome back to day two of workshop ramblings, tackle prep, clean, take care, prepare, get your stuff ready for when we're finally allowed out. And what am I up to today? Got really exciting stuff today. I know that everyone's got their own way of sharpening their knife. Some people don't even bother. <laughs> the amount of the amount of YouTube videos I watch when someone's doing some bait prep or filleting a fish and you just think to yourself, that knife is shockingly blunt. And then you see them using them on like concrete and stuff. And you're like, well, if you've put an edge on that, that's absolutely pointless. You've just blunted it. You've just dulled the edge on that within seconds. And then the next time you're trying to cut that super soft bit of bluey, or that really almost liquid piece of mackerel, you ain't got a sharp knife. So this is how I sharpen my knife. But before we can get started, and I'm waving a knife around tonight, that's not, that's not really good. Back in its sheath, safe and sound. Why don't I use the sharpener built into the sheath? Why don't you use the sharpener built into the sheath? <laughs> I hear you say, well, it's because it's rubbish. It's rubbish, and I'm going to do this more of a point of it's dull in the blade. It might put a bit of a temporary edge on, but it is truly shockingly bad. Truly shockingly bad, and I need to correct it. Now you could use an oil stone. And I can and do use an oil stone for certain things. Problem with using an oil stone, especially if you've not sharpened a knife before and until you get used to the feel and how to do it, it's easy to make mistakes. It's easy to make mistakes where you actually bevel, where you're not holding the blade at a constant angle all the time. So you get that nice, clearly defined edge that works so well with, with cutting. If you rock the knife as you're sharpening it across a stone, you don't get a very good result. How do you combat that? How do you combat that? 
Oh, damn it. <laughs> you use, or what I like to use, is the Lan the Lansky. I was going to say Lanxi. It's the Lansky system. And it compromises of a stand. I've added the piece of wood just to make it easy. And a little box of gubbins. A little box of gubbins oh, with all the shiny stuff inside. What's inside? Well, what's inside are five different grades of stones. A bottle of oil, a clamp for holding your knife blade, and five guide rods. It's as simple as that. The stones go from coarse through to ultra fine. I don't usually use ultra fine. Ultra fine is for like sushi chefs, which is just dangerous for me that with a knife, even in its case, in your box. Super, super, super razor sharp. It's not necessary. I also find that slight indifference, that slight coarseness to the fourth stone helps with gutting fish and prepping bait. It does help. So I'm going to reposition the camera. I'll show you what I've got. I'll show you how I set it up. And I'll show you how I sharpen a knife. So we have our stand. We have our knife, we have our sheath. Sheath can go away, don't need that. We've got our knife. I'm just going to move the stand to one side just for a minute. And then we've got the system. And it compromises the stones, all colour coded, all graded. And there's the five stones course through to ultra fine. We've got a clamp for holding the blade. We've got some screws for holding the clamp together. There's a tapered screw on one side. And these do not have to be super super tight. If you're using a screwdriver for these, you're probably doing them up too tight because this knurled screw is the finger screw and it only has to be finger tight. So that is the clamp. There's a natty little bottle of oil, it lasts forever. And when I say forever, I've had this a couple of years and it's about 80%, 80%. And then the difficult thing, because these are clipped in really tight to get out, and they don't sound too nice, are the guide rods. Put the box to one side, because all we're interested in at the moment is the guide rods and the stone. Five guide rods, five stones. And you start off making sure that the end grub screw is fully out. Attach the guide rod and lay it on a flat surface. Keeping them reasonably straight, tighten up the grub screw. You don't need to use pliers or anything like that. And you check on a flat surface to see that they are flat and true. And then you work your way through the others. So those are the four stones that I am going to be using. I'm going to set the fifth stone away to one side. I don't know. So we've got our clamp. We place our blade inside the clamp. This is where you need three hands. What you can do it doesn't matter how early in the morning you decide to film, my neighbours have decided to be out as well. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Go away. What's wrong with you people? Stay in bed. And that's where we're at at the moment. So the blade is just positioned inside the clamp. And just looking at that now, I think I need to move that blade across a little bit more just to make it more central. 
to make it easier for running my stone. And there we have it. So the neighbours are out in the garden at stupid clock in the morning. I'm trying to film and they're making noise. So with your knife in the clamp, your removable clamp on the stand, you take the coarse stone. It's worth mentioning that if your knife isn't that dull and you're not doing it right from basic principles, you don't need to use the coarse stone. Start on the, in fact, this is the extra coarse. You can just go straight to the coarse. But for this and for these principles, I'll show you where we're at. So I find once you've put the guide rod into the guide, there's movement there and that could cause the rocking effect that we said. So if you put your finger behind it, what you actually get is a really nice steady movement. And what you're trying to achieve is the same continuous markings or scratches all the way along the blade and there's a very easy way to check to see if you've done enough or if you need to do some more. So I would suggest, depending on how dull the blade is, that you go along two, three, possibly four times. You don't need too much pressure. You don't need a lot of pressure. And if you've got a flexible blade, especially near the tip, you can afford to just lighten the pressure right down. So once I've returned back to the start on this one, I'm gonna check to see if I've achieved what I need to achieve. And there's a very simple check to do. So you take the stone out of the guide. With a finger now, you just want to feel underneath the blade and it should catch a burr and there is absolutely at the moment no burr but if I catch the blade edge and the light I can see that my scratch marks from the stone are fairly consistent so I, I don't need much more so holding it all together with medium to light pressure Again, you feel for the for the burr with your finger now. There is absolutely no point in moving on, progressing to the other side or to another stone if you can't feel that burr. I can now feel a burr evenly along the blade and when I look at the scratch marks they're consistent and the very fine edge of the blade has got no gouges or anything missing. Now's the time when you can turn over with the same extra coarse stone and repeat the same process 
Something with the reverse side. So that section of the blade, I can feel a burr, and that section of the blade, I can feel a burr. But there's still a burr missing there, and the scratches on the blade aren't quite consistent. But you don't want to just focus in one position. You want to smooth and blur the edges. Otherwise you'll end up with shapes missing out of your blade. I don't think it needs much. So I can feel a burr all the way along there now and get the next one, which is just the plain course. A little bit of oil, doesn't need a lot. We don't need to flip the blade over, we can start where we finished from. And the same again, we're looking for continuity of scratches and we're looking to be able to feel for the burr. for the burr and also looking for the consistency of the scratches on the blade when you go down the grades in the stones all you're looking for is really you've done the hard work with the extra course what you're really looking for is that you change the the scratches on the knife edge to a consistent scratch that's relative to the stone that you're using. I'm looking for the consistency of the scratches. move down to the next stone. If your scratches aren't consistent or you can't feel the burr, you don't move on to the next stage. Now this one is a medium stone. They're all colour coded and as you can see this process doesn't take long if you can sit down at a kitchen table or in your workshop and just look to look after your kit from time to time. But what I will say is this full process doesn't have to be done every time. Quite often, I will just skip to this green stone and finish off on the blue, just to tidy up an edge that's already on there. If you look after your knife, keep it in its sheath. And don't use it on concrete. Use a chopping board. It only costs a couple of pounds. <laughs> then you've always got a sharp knife. now got a consistent burr all the way along that edge. What you find is as you work through the grades of the stones, if you've done the correct amount of work with the first stone, the subsequent stones that follow afterwards get easier and easier. All they're doing is polishing out the scratches from the previous stone. So all I'm trying to achieve now is to get rid of the scratches from the coarse stone. And then I'll put medium scratches onto the blade. If you're consistent with your approach, it doesn't take long. And at this stage, that's what I would expect. Because all the hard work's been done by the previous stones. It's also worth mentioning, as the blade gets finer and finer, as the knife edge gets finer and finer, the burr will lessen. It won't be as, as pronounced as what it was from the very start. And to the last one. So the last one, I tend to put a little bit more oil on. 
when I say a little bit more oil, you're probably looking at three or four drops of oil as opposed to one or two. So it's not a lot, but it is different. Make sure the blade of the knife is actually clean to start with. And I don't know if you can hear the difference in sound, but we are polishing out scratches now. So I'm just checking the blade, blade edge, leading edge in the light, just to check to see if the scratches on the cutting edge are consistent and if there's any defects or gouges, which there's not. Now that knife would do for most people, but there's one more stage and this stage is quite an important stage and that's stropping. I'll show you now how to strop a blade. For stropping blades, I've very conveniently got a piece of leather belt just screwed and attached to the corner of my workbench. And all you're trying to achieve now, you're not doing any sharpening, there will be a micro fine burr on the leading edge of that knife. And all you're trying to do is with a few passes of the leather strop on the rough side of the leather belt is to remove that fine burr. And that should be enough. And then there's the famous, the infamous famous check to see how sharp your knife blades are. And that's to cut pieces of paper with no gripping. A little squeak out of it maybe, as it's running across the, the paper. And that now is super, super sharp to the point where you can shave you now. And I'm not gonna do it, but some people shave their arm just to prove it. But that is super sharp. So the fire's decided to wake up and it's gone a little bit crackers and it's popping and cracking, but it's nice and warm in the workshop. And considering it is chuffing cold at the moment, um, it's all good. So what did we end up with? We've ended up with a filleting knife to be proud of. That is super sharp. <laughs> super sharp, usable, and will cut any of your bait. And that's about it for today. So all it leaves me to say is thank you for joining me. Appreciate your company. You make it all the more interesting. Tight lines and happy isolation, and I hope to see you sometime soon. Take care and bye for now.